the fifth chapter of Matthew. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Every once in a while, it's good for us to get back to the basics. And this morning, we have that opportunity. We have the opportunity to look at what is at the very core, the, the essence of our faith as we, we get a glimpse into the heart of God and we see how in His love He fulfills and provides for us the very demands that His righteousness requires. And what are those demands? Well, Jesus said in this first verse of the Gospel reading, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. Let me tell you a little bit about the scribes and Pharisees. They had really a way to lay down the law. God had given to his disciples or to his chosen people of the Old Testament ten commandments. But these scribes and Pharisees turned those 10 into some 600 plus laws and then added thousands of regulations to, 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 as to how to carry out those laws. I want to give an example. Third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It's a commandment that our Lord gave for us to set apart a day for the worship of God and for human rest. Scribes came along and thought it would be important to define what it meant to work. To carry enough honey to put on a wound. To carry enough milk to have a gulp. To carry enough ink to write a, a letter of the alphabet. And the definitions went on and on and on. Thousands of picky rules and regulations and any infraction of those rules and regulations brought severe penalties. They knew how to lay down the law and they obeyed every one of those rules and regulations. Now Jesus comes along. You might expect me to say that Jesus would change all of this. That he would, he would uh, put down those kind of demands upon people. But, but listen to what he says. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of these scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter into the kingdom of God. Rather than loosen the law as the scribes and Pharisees saw it, Jesus calls for a, a better righteousness, a higher righteousness than even that which was practiced by the scribes and Pharisees. And in the continuation of this gospel reading, that long reading that we read, Jesus describes this higher kind of righteousness. It's not on the outside, he says. It's a righteousness that is on the inside. It's inward in nature. It, it focuses on a person's inner side, his inner desires and intentions and motives. It's a, a righteousness that is found in the secret area of the heart. The scribes and Pharisees focused on the prohibition of outward acts like murder and adultery and, and the swearing of oaths. Jesus doesn't remove those prohibitions. But he carries the discussion back to the source. He carries it back to the root, to the human heart, as he speaks of anger and lust as being sin as well, and not having a, a heart for truth. On another occasion, when Jesus was accenting, placing this emphasis, he said it this way. There is nothing outside of a person which by going into him defiles him. But from within, out of the heart come evil thoughts and murder and adultery and coveting and, and envy and slander. All of these things come from the inside and they defile the human being. In our world when we, where we tend to concentrate on outward appearance and outward behavior, I think it's well for us to 
heed our Lord's warning, to pay attention to what's going on on the inside. To Jesus, thoughts were as important as actions. Desires were as important as deeds. Indeed, both could be damning. It's not just a, a sin to murder a person. It's a sin, Jesus says, to be angry with another person. It's not just wrong to commit adultery, but it's a sin to look at another person uh, in such a way that you turn them into an object of desire. The higher righteousness that Jesus demands isn't just on the outside. It's an inner righteousness. God's claim to obedience is a total claim. It involves the whole person. You shall be perfect, Jesus says, from the inside out, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. But if that's the case, then who can be saved? It's a question that Jesus' disciples asked of him when on another occasion he was laying down the law in all of its severity. And perhaps it's, it's an appropriate question for us to ask as well today because not one of us meets this inner righteousness that Jesus is speaking of here. And I suspect that Jesus knew it when he said these words. That he knew that these demands were impossible for us to reach. That this, this inner righteousness required was beyond our ability. And he also knew, and this is so important, that only when we understood that, when we were convinced that there was no way in which we could save ourselves, that we would ever be driven to the grace of our Almighty God, the only one who is able to, to save us. To the question that the disciples asked, then who can be saved, Jesus responded with this statement. He said, with men, this is impossible. But with God, everything is possible. Indeed, it is God himself who makes the possible a reality for us. When in his loving kindness, he sent his one and only son. A son who lived this inner righteousness in our place. A son who paid the penalty for our unrighteousness. A son who gives forgiveness and life to everybody. All of it through faith in him. Let me be very, very clear. You and I will never reach the goal of perfection that God requires. But in Jesus Christ, there's forgiveness for you. In Jesus Christ, there's this new life for you. In Jesus Christ, the righteousness that God requires is the righteousness that he gives to you. He gives it to you through faith in Jesus Christ. Except your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, Jesus said, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus Christ, my friends, you have that righteousness that exceeds theirs. God made him, St. Paul says, to be sin for us who knew no sin, so that we might possess the very righteousness of God. That means you've got it. That means you're saved. That means you have salvation, past tense. That means you have eternal life. Well, this is the first and the primary lesson that this scripture teaches to us. And it's most important for us to understand. But there is also a second lesson that I think we Christians should take to heart. It's not a lesson about how we can save ourselves. We already have salvation in Jesus Christ. No, this is a lesson that instructs us as Christians who have been saved by God's grace as we take up the struggle against sin in our own life. In the Gospel reading, Jesus reminds us that sin always involves a process. Take, for example, that first paragraph where Jesus speaks about murder. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. 
But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Everyone who insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hells of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and, and go. Be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Do you catch the process that Jesus states takes place? Sin always begins as an inner thought. Then it, it, it picks up steam as it gels into an attitude. Then this is followed by outward anger, angry words perhaps, and then can finally explode into some violent act. The process, the thought, the attitude, the words, and then finally the action. Every sin in our life follows that kind of process. It always begins on the inside and then finally shows itself on the outside. As we fight against the sin in our lives, our Lord directs us to, to break the process, to, as it were, nip it in the bud. At the first sign, he says, go and be reconciled. Acknowledge the sin that is present within your heart. Confess it and, and be restored and, and be reconciled. Don't let sin get control of your life. It's a good lesson for us to learn as we struggle against sin. But let me remind you again of the primary lesson. No matter how much we struggle against sin in our life, the righteousness, the perfection required by God is beyond our reach. But the good news is that we can possess it. Indeed, we do possess it in Jesus Christ. For here is the one who lived our life for us, who died our death for us, and who rose on the third day to proclaim it to the whole world. We have it, that perfection, that righteousness, through faith in Jesus Christ. And that makes us, as Jesus said at the beginning of these Beatitudes, his blessed ones. And it also makes us labor to take up the battle against sin, to battle with that sin with a heart that is filled with thankfulness to God and to Jesus Christ, to whom we always give the glory. And now may the peace of God that passes all our understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.